Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm Lindsay. You sure are. Oh my gosh. You're Lindsay. I, uh, that, that protection, Sumerian protection spell uh-huh. that, that starts the show that we have on a blanket uh, that's been for sale on the store. Yeah. I uh, was at Will XX's Salt Lake City studio. I'm wearing his uh, black salt shirt right now, a uh, yeah. tattoo artist and a fan of the show and friend. And he had that blanket there, and I forgot that it was our blanket. He didn't have the blanket. He had the flag. Flag. Okay. The big, like, um, like tapestry. 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 Oh, this guy. Tapestry. And uh, and I had, like, just felt like an idiot. I was like, oh, man, that's cool. And he's like, yeah, that's yours. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I thought that looked familiar. <laughs> you are a genius. Genius. You know so many things about things. <laughs> uh, speaking of merch, look at new merch hitting the Bad Magic store this week. Uh, pretty interesting design. Pretty wild, actually. Is it wild, cool, and interesting? Oh, it is. Uh, you can head on to uh, over to badmagicmerch.com and pick up a wild, interesting, cool tea today. <laughs> Had no idea Logan was designing this shirt until I checked our design board for announcements, and I think it's very funny. So well played, Merch Wizard, a.k.a. Art Warlock, uh, Logan Keith. I love it. We've gotten so many comments about wild, cool, interesting. I just, I just love that it went on so long, and I had no idea that those were our three two go to adge- or our three go to adjectives. Oh, I've known for a while. <laughs> I didn't realize I was saying wild so much. Oh, it's wild. No, I was saying wild. You oh, kept I saying, was saying interesting. interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, so I wasn't. Okay, you were saying wild. I was wild. Saying, I, I was probably saying cool. P- probably because it's like an old man thing to say. Oh, like, oh that's it is? cool. It's old now. Uh, no. it's, it's a boomer uh, term. I don't know. I say, I still say groovy and dope. So like, how old am I? Can I say? Am I am I allowed to say sick? That's so sick. That's sick, bruh. I don't think anybody's saying that. Okay. All right. What well, Kyler taught me a new one. Cop. Oh, I'm gonna go cop a. I'm gonna go cop a new T-shirt. I was like, I'm a what? I always heard that one growing up as cop a feel. Right. Well. Well. Now, now, I mean, now I guess, it's cop a lot of things. Right. You can cop anything. Oh man. You're just going to get something. Ah. Uh, okay. You know, like. Oh, I'll cop a Coke. So you you could cop a feel if you want. <laughs> Just d- different. Um, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what what fan submitted horror stories do you have for us today, Lindsay Marie? Well, ooh, middle name. Yeek. Am I in trouble? Is that do you associate that with being in trouble? Is yes, your mom of like, course. Lindsay Marie. Lindsay Marie. Okay. Right. Like, Lindsay uh, Marie Faith. Ah, no, thank you. Uh, I have three stories today. Woo. Oh. Okay. A little something something extra. Might be a longer episode. I have two stories and one's a little bigger. Oh, I guess we should have conferred. That's all right. That's okay. Let's they, do it. They love it. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have three stories. My first story is about not only shadow people and not only the hat man, but what happens when they show up together, which is terrifying. Oh, we haven't had one of those stories in a while. All right. I, I don't like know it. that I've ever read a story well, uh, about uh, shadow man and hat man, shadow people and hat man being together. I just meant we hadn't had a hat man or a shadow person story in a while. I follow you. Yeah, now, I we, see. now we get both. Two for one special. Then we have a story about a nightmare that literally becomes reality, which is weird. And then we have a ghost who likes to smoke. Interesting. Mm-hmm. It is interesting. It's uh, wild. God, I didn't even mean to do it that time. Damn it. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I want to say I have like little like buzzers. Like every time you uh-huh. say it, I do it and you, you get zapped. I get zapped. Yeah, like oh, some behavioral so technique. Oh, so fun. Okay. <laughs> I have my usual two. First, a bit bigger than normal. I'm going to share a lot of uh, haunted lore that surrounds Kentucky's Bobby Mackey's music world. Uh, Joe Bob Ta- Mackey? Bobby Mackey. So not Bob Mackey. Mm-mm. Okay. Bobby Mackey's Music World. Uh, Joe recognized this from the Ghost Adventures episodes. Uh, this place is so infamously haunted, Jack, uh, Zach Baggins and the Ghost Adventures team explored it for their series premiere. Wow. Of that incredibly popular ghost hunting series. And then returned a few seasons later to the same location. Do several different ghosts and possibly some demons as well haunt an old honky-tonk bar that sits on the grounds of a one-time slaughterhouse and mafia hotspot. Was it the honky-tonk grill? That's not the Honky Tonk Grill. No Toby Keith? Nope. Okay. Uh, next, the very unusual story of 
uh, Audrey Marie Santo. Was this poor girl some kind of vessel for paranormal, perhaps even heavenly activity? Was she capable of the miraculous? Not a scary story, just another interesting angle on what may be possible with the paranormal. Okay. I'm into that. You ready to uh, show off your socks and get started? I love your dress, by the way. Thank you. You look extra beautiful. Oh, thank you. That's so nice. Yeah. Do you want me to say one last time what the charity was for this month? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. I, I thought that was a good idea. Okay. Okay. I also bit my cheek. So if I slur my words, I'm really sorry my cheek is swollen on the inside. And I find myself kind of like doing that. <laughs> it's really obnoxious. Uh, for the last time this month, the Halo Dental Network is our uh, charitable donation that we made this month of $14,300. Another $1,600 being set aside for the Future Cummins Family Scholarship Fund. Uh, more info coming about the scholarship in months to come, but the Halo Network was founded by Dr. Brady Smith. It's a coalition of dental professionals who donate their services to the dental underserved. Services include dental implants, veneers, crowns, and fillings. If you want to learn more, please visit Halo Denter, Halo Dent, I can't speak. See? Halo Dental Network. Dot org. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not only can you donate, you can also nominate someone in need. And now, yes, I will show you my socks, but first I have to cover up with um, this blanket because, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. short dress. Okay. Today, yeah. Ooh, I went with aliens. aliens. Yeah. There we go. Wait, there it is. Hello. <laughs> okay. Not much uh, setup uh, for this first tale. Okay. We'll be getting in pretty quick. Okay. Get in. Have you ever been to a place that felt so evil, so full of dark, dangerous energy that you knew right away you should leave? A place reportedly full of not just spirits, but also demonic entities. A place where spirits refuse to coexist peacefully with humans and actively seek to harm anyone who enters their space. Bob Mackey's Music World, in the little town of Wilder, Kentucky, just seven miles south of downtown Cincinnati, claims to be exactly such a place. It's reported by many to be the most haunted nightclub in America. And if you believe all the legends... A dark and bloody history has led directly to its current reputation. Time now for the tale of the spirits of Bob Mackey's music world. In the 1850s, the site of Bob Mackey's was a large slaughterhouse and meatpacking facility constructed to serve Northwest Kentucky and Cincinnati, Ohio. Workers dug a pit of sorts in the basement, called a well in numerous sources, but not a well in the traditional sense. No one was taking any water from it. They were feeding it with all the blood and waste from the animals slaughtered there. There are rumors that the slaughterhouse owner would dispose of just about anything in this pit, or anyone, if you paid him enough. How many humans' remains may, be, may have been dumped into this pit are a mystery. The slaughterhouse closed down in the 1890s, and shortly following this closure, more rumors soon began to circulate. That now satanic cults were using the empty building for their rituals, and that they used the old pit, described again as a well, uh, to dispose of animal sacrifices, and possibly human sacrifices as well. It supposedly went on for years. Next in the lore of the building's history are tales of murder. At Bobby Mackey's and in the immediate area around it, there have reportedly been numerous extremely gruesome murders over the years. Perhaps the most disturbing is the murder of 22-year-old Pearl Bryan. Pearl was a young woman from Greencastle, Indiana, a few short hours' drive away from Bobby Mackey's. And in 1896, her headless corpse was discovered in a field just two miles from the former slaughterhouse. Some think she'd been killed at Bobby Mackey's right uh, or something she'd been at Bobby Mackey's right before she was killed, that maybe even was killed there, and that her body was then dumped a few miles away. An examination of her body revealed that she was five months pregnant when she died. Oh, shoot. Scott Jackson, Pearl's boyfriend at the time and a student at the Ohio College of Dental Surgery, had convinced her to come to Cincinnati so he could arrange an abortion. Pearl left home on February 1st, 1896, telling her parents she was going to Indianapolis, and she did go there, but then she kept going all the way to Cincinnati and just beyond it. According to the legend, instead of taking Pearl to a doctor or a surgeon, Jackson and his roommate Alonzo Walling attempted to perform the abortion themselves. Oh my God! They first tried inducing a miscarriage with chemicals and cocaine. When that failed, they used dental tools. Oh my God. And they went to the old abandoned slaughterhouse to do it where no one would see them, where no one would hear Pearl scream if something went wrong. And the surgery did go wrong. Pearl died. In an attempt to cover their tracks, they placed her body in an empty field and removed her head so she couldn't be identified. They almost got away with all of this, but... They left Pearl's shoes on her feet, and the police found the manufacturer of those shoes, Lewis and Hayes, who confirmed the pair was sold to Pearl Bryan. Some seriously impressive 1890s detective work led to multiple murder charges. And the trial for Pearl's murder became quite the local spectacle. 
It was all anyone in the area seemed to talk about. Tickets were sold to the hearing. Over 5,000 people stood outside the courthouse waiting for the news on the day of the jury's verdict. During the trial, Alonzo Walling testified that it was Jackson's idea to cut Pearl up in order to make her remains harder to identify. He and his roommate, Scott Jackson, were both found guilty of murder in 1897 and both sentenced to death. Strangely, Jackson and Walling were supposedly both offered life in prison to be spared the death penalty if they'd only reveal the location of Pearl's head. But they refused. Why? What could they have been possibly hiding that would turn them or lead them to turn down a deal to save their lives? Both men were executed on March 21st, 1897 in front of thousands of witnesses. And while standing on the gallows, Alonzo Walling, furious he had also been given the death penalty for being dragged into his roommate's abortion scheme, vowed to haunt the area forever. Pearl's head was never found. More rumors now swirled. These new rumors asserted that Jackson was involved in a satanic cult that would meet and make sacrifices in the old slaughterhouse, and that Pearl's head must have been used in some kind of ritual inside the slaughterhouse. And the two men wouldn't admit any of this because they would supposedly suffer Satan's wrath if they revealed the location of her head. Bloodhounds used to find Pearl's head led investigators to the abandoned building, now known as Bobby's Mackey, Bobby Mackey's Music World, but then police couldn't find her head once they got there. Was it thrown down into that old slaughterhouse pit? The remains of the former slaughterhouse completely demolished in the early 20th century, and then the lot sat empty until the 1920s, when a new building was erected that served as a casino, nightclub, and speakeasy during Prohibition. A decade later, in the 1930s, a man named E.A. Buck Brady purchased the building and named the nightclub and gambling hall Primrose. He operated the club successfully for around a decade, and then that success caught the attention of the Cincinnati mob, who tried to buy him out, but he refused to sell. Mobsters then started threatening Buck and his customers in the parking lot, and that harassment led to Buck drawing his gun on a mobster named Albert Red Masterson. That incident caught the attention of local law enforcement, and then Buck was charged with attempted murder. Then there are two different accounts of what happened next. Buck either walked away from the business in 1946 or took his own life inside the club. Either way, the building sat vacant again for a few years before reopening as a nightclub named Latin Quarter in the 1950s. And this new chapter would add more tragedy to the historical lore. Joanna was a dance hall girl and the daughter of the owner. When she worked at the Latin Quarter, she was young and beautiful. And she fell in love with Robert Randall Mackey, a singer and regular performer at the club. And like Pearl many years before her, she became pregnant out of wedlock. She and Robert intended to run away together, but Joanna's father forbade her to leave and then used some criminal connections to have Robert killed. They tried to make it look like a suicide and left his body hanging in the dressing room. When Joanna learned what had happened, she poisoned her father, then killed herself in the building's basement. Once more, the location was abandoned. A few years later, the club now reopened again as a bar called the Hard Rock Cafe, not associated with the famous restaurant chain. Nearly every night was full of violence and crime, drunken fights, shootings, drugs, illegal sex work. There were rumors that the mob owned the club. What is currently the men's restroom was supposedly the mob's main office, where there was allegedly a trap door that led straight down to the old slaughterhouse well. January of 1978, after a series of shootings and other crimes at the club, local authorities shut it down. Later that year, a young country singer named Bobby Mackey purchased the building and reopened it yet again. He turned it into Bobby Mackey's Music World, a now famous country and honky-tonk music hall and tavern. Bobby claims he's a skeptic and that he hasn't seen anything himself, but as you'll soon find out, that might not be true. It might just be what Bobby tells himself. Even though he doesn't necessarily trust what he has seen, he believes much of the lore about what's happened in, around, and under the building he's now long owned. And he also believes most of the paranormal encounter stories shared to him by various members of his family, employees, local police officers, and assorted bar patrons. Interestingly, Bobby Mackey's real name is Robert Randall Mackey, the exact same name as Joanna's supposed former lover, the man left hanging in the dressing room. Bobby's mother originally named him Randy, but a day after his birth, she decided to change his name to Robert Randall. Another interesting coincidence, the railroad track behind the building runs all the way to Bob Mackey's childhood home, as if fate is somehow linking him to the bar, as if the bar chose him to reopen it. Bobby came across the abandoned building that is now his business while out driving one day. He didn't tell his wife Janet about it until he'd already spoken with the real estate agent. As author Douglas Hensley wrote in his book, Hell's Gate Terror at Bobby Mackey's Music World, he had inspected the abandoned casino prior to bringing Janet to see it. And when he did, he found himself experiencing some sort of deja vu. 
He had never stepped foot inside that place until that moment, but he seemed to know the layout of each room before entering it. He could not quite put his finger on it, but the structure seemed like home, some long-forgotten memory of the past. Did the murdered singer reincarnate somehow, the old Robert Randall Mackey, coming back as the new Robert Randall Mackey? Janet could tell her husband desperately wanted to buy the building, even if it didn't seem like a wise investment to her. Janet, not nearly a biggest fan, a biggest fan is a place, as her husband. Once she stepped inside the place for the first time, after she and her husband had bought it, she claimed to feel an evil emanating from the building. She claims that during her first visit, she saw something moving at the top of a set of concrete steps that led to the first door, and then later during the same visit, watched a metal door open all by itself. As Douglas Hensley wrote, Once inside the darkened nightclub, Janet felt a slow, uneasy trepidation creep over her, a fear that she could not explain, but nevertheless, a very real and disturbing fear. Janet was also, during the initial visit, distracted by thinking that she'd seen some shadowy figure in a large mirror. And then she heard Bobby call out, Hey, lady, wait a minute. Hey, lady, wait. But then when Janet questioned her husband about this, he insisted he hadn't said that. It was just her imagination. Bobby also blames his own paranormal encounter that day on his imagination. He said, I was up there on the stage imagining the room filled with people dancing and singing, you know. And then I thought I saw a woman in a white gown with a long... Uh, light brown hair walking across the room near the front of the bar. She disappeared in the dark by the door we came in, but it was nothing. I just let my imagination run away with me, that's all. As the two were about to leave the building after their first visit there together, as they passed the ballroom, Bobby jumped up onto the stage and began singing. And according again to Douglas Henley, Hensley, a cold surge of fear shot through Janet, like ice water rushing through her veins, as she stood there on the hardwood dance floor staring up at her husband, who seemed to be in some sort of trance. As Bobby continued singing the song, his voice sounded more and more distant, and the unexplainable fear Janet was feeling became even more prevalent, crowding the room with an overbearing sense of evil. Her skin felt instantly clammy, and a nauseating hot sensation flooded her body, giving her the feeling that something inside these walls would surely choke the life from her if she didn't get out. The air inside the room was still and close and smelled too much like a crypt, a tomb, waiting to swallow her very soul at any hint of animosity. She slowly scanned the area with her eyes and felt something now watching her from somewhere in the shadowy recesses of the room. She felt as if a thousand tiny, dark, evil eyes were staring at her from somewhere in the darkened shadows of the room. Janet now insisted they leave right away. As they left the ballroom, a light flickered. Bobby said it was a bad switch, but Janet doesn't believe that for a second. She gave one last look at the building and was captivated by the brilliant setting sun illuminating the bar. The glow blazed like a million burning embers, igniting the air and changing it into a thousand particles of luminous yellow dust. Then as she looked deep into the overwhelming fiery tones that were lengthening in front of her, she felt another sudden jolt of fright when she saw a pair of red, unearthly eyes staring back at her. The next day, Janet and Bobby met Carl Lawson, future caretaker of Bobby Mackey's. Excuse me, uh, former and future caretaker. Uh, Carl had formerly worked at the old club and wanted to meet the Mackey's. He told them that the, he had worked at the for the two previous owners, knew where everything was, and was looking for more work. The Mackeys were in need of someone to clean up the place to prepare for renovations, so Carl started that day. Bobby left Janet and Carl alone to go upstairs to work, and Carl, having just heard how terrible Janet's first visit to the club was, suddenly turned to her and said, Don't worry about the ghosts in here. They're my friends. That did not make Janet feel better. She was trying to convince herself that Bobby was right, that she just let her imagination get the best of her. She and Carl then both suddenly heard a thump inside the casino room, stretching out through the rest of the first floor like a fading shot bouncing off a canyon wall. When they went to investigate, they found that a giant picture of a flamingo had been knocked to the floor. Carl picked it up, then looked to the ceiling and whispered, I'm back, and I'm here to stay this time. I won't leave again, I promise. Janet got the chills. Luckily, she was left alone for the rest of that visit. But then just a few days later, she was attacked by something else in the building for the first time. She arrived in the morning to get some work done. She was pregnant, couldn't do any heavy lifting, so she decided to sweep the ballroom. Soon she became tired, stopped for a break. She decided to go talk to Carl about the ghosts, eager to learn as much as she could about that strange place. She first looked for Carl in the casino room, couldn't find him, walked back to the ballroom, and as she walked towards the doorway, something made her stop dead in her tracks. Her arms hung rigid as her eyes swept the darkened shadows of the casino room. As she stood there emotionless, a cold, or as she stood there motionless, a cold, soul-piercing chill passed through her body, causing her to shudder uncontrollably as the hairs on the back of her neck bristled. She was hearing whispering from all around her. Janet tried to call out for Carl and Bobby, 
but the words wouldn't come. Then she heard a man distinctly whisper, Get out! in a voice like sandpaper. Meanwhile, Carl smelled roses around him while he worked in another room. He'd been at the bar long enough to know what that meant. The ghost of Joanna was near. The young, beautiful woman who'd killed herself in the basement after her lover and the father of her baby had been killed. She was known in life to wear a perfume that smelled like roses, and Carl had smelled that scent many times before encountering her ghost. Carl asked Joanna and any other entities around him not to hurt him, Bobby, or Janet. Then he ran towards the ballroom, walked in on Janet frozen in fear as a ladder fell towards her. He grabbed her in time to yank her out of its way. Janet sat down and demanded that Carl tell her the history of the bar. And Carl said, I've never told anyone what I'm going to tell you, but after what happened today, I think maybe you ought to know. He said, a few years ago, I was here alone cleaning the club. It was raining hard and all the doors were locked, so I didn't expect any visitors. Anyway, I'm busy doing my job and all of a sudden, I look up and there's this lady standing there. Scared the you-know-what out of me. After I got my breath back, I asked her what she was doing. She just kind of giggled like a little schoolgirl and said she was waiting for Robert Randall to come back for her. The young woman then told Carl that he was her fiancé and that her father didn't like him, so he murdered him. She said she couldn't live without him and ended her life in the bar. Carl figured she was just some crazy woman who'd escaped from the nut house, and he told her to get out, but she said she would never leave until Robert came back. And then she said that when Robert did come back, all hell would break loose. Carl walked over to the phone and called the police, but then when he turned around to look at her as he dialed, she was gone. He ran around checking the building for her, found out that all the doors were indeed locked, and he realized he'd been talking to a ghost. Over the years, talking to lots of people and doing his own research, he said he learned her name was Joanna, and he told Janet that following that visit, she appeared to him several more times. Once when Carl was drunk, he heard her say, beware of the evil that hides inside. Then he heard her say as if she was talking to someone else, don't harm this man, he's the keeper of the beasts and the children. Beasts and children, what could that possibly mean? Carl uh, now told Janet that Joanna was a good spirit, but that something else that was evil also lived inside the bar. And he promised he'd figure out what it was sooner or later and help get rid of it. When Janet and Carl stood up following this conversation to go find Bobby, they now heard a frantic scratching sound with a terrible suddenness coming from the door beneath their feet. Carl said he'd heard this exact noise many times before and felt like it was something trying to lure him down into the basement. Said he'd never gone down there to see what it was. He told Janet he was also scared to go in some of the uh, other rooms at night. Janet, now freaked out more than ever, told Bobby when she found him a minute later everything that had just happened. She told him that he shouldn't reopen the club, that he should sell the building, and, uh, you know, they got into a huge shouting match. Bobby refused to sell. He was determined to make his dream of owning a country music venue come true, and he felt like this was his destiny. Janet ended up agreeing to let Bobby do what he was determined to do, and they finished renovating the place and had a grand opening. Bobby ended up adding a new stage, dance floor, mechanical bull, bar, pool tables, spruced up the building's big various rooms to create a fun place, at least for those who the spirits chose not to harass, to dance and drink the night away. The paranormal sightings and experiences then continued to haunt Janet, Carl, many of the bar's patrons, and many of the employees for years afterwards, right up until the present. Nearly everyone who has ever worked at the bar believes it's haunted, except for Bobby Mackey. At least he won't admit it. Carl Lawson, as the caretaker, would live in a small upstairs apartment above the bar alone for years after it opened. And he claims that every morning at 6 a.m., he was woken by the sound of an army marching through the bar. Says he was too afraid to go downstairs and never inspect the noise. Instead, he locked himself in his room, slept with a loaded shotgun near his bed. Carl claims that while living there, he ended up becoming a victim of some kind of demonic possession as well that a minister had to perform an exorcism in the kitchen and heal him in August of 1991. During the exorcism, Carl Latt was told he laughed maniacally that at one point he even put his hands around the pastor's neck and tried to choke him. He would later claim no memory of any of this. At one point during the exorcism, the preacher said, it's time for you to leave Carl alone. And Carl screamed, I won't go. I'm not leaving. If I leave, we all have to leave. Carl then fell out of his chair and said, I don't have to go nowhere. This body is mine. This body is mine. Bobby Mackey, who actually witnessed this, states that no part of him believes that Carl was just putting on a show. He says Carl showed a completely different personality during the entire ordeal. And yet somehow, Bobby still refused to believe any spirits inhabited the bar. While this exorcism seemed to work, the paranormal terror was not over. Not long after the exorcism, one of the kitchen walls caught on fire. The fire department never could determine the cause. Not long after that, Rich Lawson, a regular patron, said he felt a suffocating presence in the men's restroom one night. A metal trash can flew across the room at him. More disturbingly, after the trash can flew through the air, he saw a man with a mustache standing behind him before just disappearing. 
Before he disappeared, he asked the man what his problem was, and the bathroom became intensely hot, and the man repeated over and over, die game, die game, die game. On another occasion, Janet claimed she was overcome by the scent of roses in the basement. She says she was a target almost every time she set foot inside the bar. The last time she ever visited the bar, Janet was in the upstairs apartment. Carl had now moved out. He couldn't handle it all anymore after his exorcism. And she felt an invisible force grab her around the waist. She claims it picked her up, floated her through the air, and almost threw her down a steep flight of stairs. When it tossed her down, she heard a male figure scream at her, Get out! Get out! Get out! And she did what was commanded. She's never been back inside the club since that incident. Sightings and encounters have continued since Janet stopped coming. Old photos of Pearl Bryan match witness descriptions of a headless ghost and odd clothing seen by a few staff members. Photos of former owner Buck Brady also match descriptions of spirits seen at the bar. The paranormal hotspots seem to be the spotlight room, the catwalk above the stage, the basement well, the old china room, a platform area near the kitchen, and an odd staircase. A set of stairs near the basement well have been deemed the stairs that lead to nowhere because they truly do lead to a blank wall. Some who've been brave enough to venture down these stairs have reported hearing phantom footsteps behind them. The basement itself, sometimes called the Room of Faces. Several different people who have ventured down there have reported seeing evil faces appear on the floor and walls. Club manager Laura Rowland claims that on a few different occasions when going through the building and closing down for the night, she's found the lights on, doors unlocked, and the jukebox playing the anniversary waltz which is terrifying because the jukebox is unplugged when this happens and the anniversary waltz is not a song in the jukebox catalog. Laura has also reported feeling the building shake while she closed up one night. Fearing an earthquake, she ran outside. Everything stopped and the building was perfectly still. If there was an earthquake, it was never reported. Another employee once said they saw a dark, angry man behind the bar and the spirit of Joanna. All of these claims drew the interest of Zach Baggins and the Ghost Adventures crew. They picked Bobby Mackey's world, as I said, for the series premiere back on October 17th, 2008. They would interview Bob Mackey and Carl Lawson about their experiences. When the team asked Carl if the evil spirits were still inside the bar, he said, I feel them now. Carl then took them uh, into his old apartment, where he claimed to feel a burst of cold air on the stairs, as if he pulled open a refrigerator door. He said he felt the spirits watching him while he was inside the apartment. The current caretaker at this time, Matt Coates, reported being one of the people to have seen faces in the basement said he also saw a glowing green satanic pentagram on the floor. And he said when he put his hand to the floor to touch it, it burned him. During the filming of that first episode, Ghost Adventures team member Nick Groff went to use the men's room and heard something bang on the wall twice. Fellow team member Aaron Goodwin also heard the noise. When they taunted the spirit making the noise, they heard it again, now also heard footsteps above their heads. When Zach Baggins investigated the basement, he said he felt a tingling sensation on his back, which quickly turned into a burning sensation. He then lifted up his shirt and revealed three long, thin scratches. And when he confronted the spirits in the room for attacking him, he said he was scratched again. As Zach left the basement, cameras capturing, uh, as Zach left the basement, cameras captured a small orb of light flying away from his back. Cameras also picked up a moving shadow in the basement that appeared to be the shape of a man. After filming the episode, a few crew members reported dark energy following them home into their personal lives. Nick reported hearing pots and pans banging around in his house. And he said a girl he was dating had her rosary ripped off her neck and dragged across the floor by an invisible force. Aaron and his wife actually separated after their investigation. They both started sharing the same nightmare about Bobby Mackey's. He believes that the investigation led to the end of his marriage. Despite all of this, the Ghost Adventures team later returned to the bar while filming episode 29 during season 4 in October of 2010. Once again, they claimed to encounter a lot of paranormal activity. A special guest of theirs, Bishop James Long, felt sharp needles drag across his hand and discovered three scratches. An invisible force also knocked an EVP device out of his hand. When Bishop James put blessed oil on Zach's forehead, his skin burned. When he put a special medallion on caretaker Matt Coates' neck, his skin burned as well. While filming this episode, the team used a spirit box to try and communicate with entities in the building. And they seemed to have made contact. They heard, I can't go back in there. When asked why the spirit couldn't come up from the basement to the bar. Spirits also seemed to target Bishop James. The spirit box picked up, it's going down with the bishop. Bad day. When asked who was going to have a bad day, they heard the bishop. While Bishop James performed a blessing on the building, Aaron Goodwin said later that he started to feel angry. When Bishop James threw holy water, Aaron imagined himself beating the bishop up, and then he told Bishop James that he wanted to kill him. He was later extremely disturbed by these feelings. He'd never been so affected by a paranormal investigation before. 
Despite all this activity, the bar remains open to this day, and Bobby Mackey still runs it. Matt Coates, still the caretaker, at least was a, a few years ago. He thinks something there doesn't want him to leave. He said he's tried to quit multiple times, but always keeps coming back. Several different clergy members and psychics have tried to cleanse the bar, drive out the dark energy, but nothing has ever worked. So why is Bob, Bobby Mackey such a hot spot of dark energy? Plenty of other locations have been home to more murder and suicide and tragedy than this club. Locations that don't share the same amount of paranormal activity. According to some people, the bar's basement houses some kind of portal to hell itself, or at least a gate into another realm. The Ghost Adventures team proposed a theory that Bobby Mackey himself unknowingly fuels the demonic energy in the building with his presence. He was attracted to the bar by some unseen force and now continually brings in new people for the spirits to interact with. And he does seem to have many strange connections to the bar. Bobby doesn't buy this theory, though. He says it's all just strange coincidences. Although supposedly not a believer, Bobby has capitalized on the spirits. The bar's slogan is come for the ghosts and stay for the music. Oh my God. If you want to meet Bobby... He and his Big Mac band play at the bar at 10 p.m. a lot of Friday and Saturday nights. You can check their website for the schedule. Or if you're feeling more adventurous, you can book a private tour and search for the spirits yourself. Just be careful. The spirits there seem to love nothing more than terrorizing anyone who dares to wander downstairs. And if the Ghost Adventures team members are to be, are to be believed, you might just bring something back home with you. No way. We can't go because our marriage will end. Yikes. Well... I know, don't want to risk that. Don't, absolutely not. True. The heck? That's a lot of stuff going on there. I know, there's there. a lot of lore there. Do you want to see some pictures? I do. Uh, this first one is a picture of the back of Bobby Mackey's music world and the train tracks that connect it to where Bobby grew up. So it, it, it does have a very honky-tonk, you know, rural kind of feel to this place. Like, like a just an old building, not really uh, nice looking from the outside. That looks like it came out of a quiet place. Oh, it does. Doesn't yes, it? Yes, that movie. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this next one, uh, haunted disclaimer sign inside the bar. They were actually once sued for $1,000 by a patron who claimed that a ghost assaulted them. Oh, was that the wrong picture? There it is. Warning to our patrons. This oh, sorry, sorry, Joe. I skipped I skipped one. That that previous one was a picture. We can go back one. A picture of Bobby Mackey's from the front. This guy. I just, uh, I skipped a number two picture there. There we go. I mean, it's not even exciting looking. Yeah, just a rough old country honky-tonk bar. And then this next one's that sign. Yeah, sorry yeah, about that. Yeah, that's okay. Warning to our patrons. This establishment is purported to be haunted. Management is not, underlined two times, responsible and cannot be held liable for any actions of any ghost <laughs> spirits on this premises. Uh, liable, not yeah. liable. Those are two different things. I, I hate that we have liable and liable. Uh-huh. I know. So yeah, so close. Uh, this next one is a, is a picture of an alleged spirit taken on the stairs to the basement. Okay. I mean, that is fucking creepy. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for those of you listening uh, and not watching, you can find these photos on Scared to Death's Instagram. Uh, or but, Facebook. Or Facebook. But what we're looking at right now is the outline, of, a human outline that is very, very white and translucent. And it's coming down a set of stairs. That is Whoa. Yeah. And and I'm sorry, I, I kind of zoned out for a second because it I was staring at the photo. Zach Baggins got this or somebody else? Oh, uh, you know what? Or does it matter? Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. I can't, okay, I can't sorry. remember now, but I think it was the Ghost Adventures team. Okay, I, I thought you well, said. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think so. Uh, th and this next one is uh, what remains that old slaughterhouse well slash pit in the basement. So that little hole back there. That is weird. <laughs> right. Where supposedly, yeah, they would throw all the remains of the animals that they weren't, you know, selling. I imagine that it used to be bigger. Yeah, probably. Yeek. Okay. And, and then this uh, this last one, just a, uh, you know, old picture of Pearl Bryan, the woman who died from that botched abortion and oh, whose God, head was never found. Oh, that is the saddest. Yeah. Oh, man. Mm, all the weird things going on in the world right now, it made me so upset. Mm -hmm. mm. No mas. Yeah. Uh, yikes. Yeah. Okay, would you let me buy a haunted bar? Uh, I guess it depends on what your plan was. I mean, I, let me. Would we buy a haunted bar? Right. Um, no, I, I don't know. You know, like, there, there's, I mean, I guess maybe, I mean, there's that one, like, Madame Delphine's house in New Orleans that if we had, oh, like, yeah. lots of money. I mean, it is a cool old house. I might want something like that, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if, okay, money's not an object. Let's like let's play that game. Yeah, money's not an object. So, 
you buy that, but then like, I don't ever want to work there. I don't want to go in there. Like somebody, it would just be cool to be like, oh yeah, no, I own a haunted place, but I don't want anything to physically do with it. I want to explore it. I want to stay there, but know that I didn't have to live there. I could go some other place if I get too freaked out. Do you want to buy Nick Cage's old house? That's the one. That's the one. That's the one, right? Yep. Yep. Oh man. Well, I don't know if Nick Cage can't handle it. We probably can't handle it. You know what I mean? Because he's a little. He's he's eccentric. Uh huh. Yeah. He's a. I, I I love him. He's an interesting. It seems like an interesting guy. Well, gosh dang. He's a character. Seems like a fascinating guy. Yeah, he is a character. Is what you're supposed to say. There we go. He's a character. Okay, a couple things. Was it common to buy tickets to a jury? That yeah. was so weird. I'd or, never heard that. N- I don't. I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I mean, the law would vary from place to place. I don't know if they like made extra seating and turned it into yeah. a show. I mean, I mean, they would do things around like the turn of like the uh, you know twentieth uh, century, of the you know the, the beginning of it, where they would like. It was common to go to crime scenes, and and people would like have like s- like snack vendors and stuff at a I, crime scene. Yeah, like where something something bad happened. I mean, sometimes they would like loot the crime scenes. I mean, it was like weird in some like towns uh, around America, and they would they would they take pictures and make like postcards of like bodies and stuff. It was really really dark. Um, I learned that in some true crime things we explored on Time Suck, and then people would you know hop on the train and go like spend the day with the family, checking out where people got you know supposedly murdered. Uh, you know, or whatever, or the, and they would go to like watch public executions and watch hangings and stuff, and it was like a whole family affair. Let's watch this uh, guy get hanged. Okay, well, to me, those are two very different things. If you were going to go watch a man or woman be hanged, uh, and you're going as a family, it almost feels like it serves as a lesson to your children of like, hey, you can really get in a lot of trouble for <laughs> yeah. not obeying the law, I guess right? So, yeah. so I. Guess I can extreme, yeah, extreme, but relevant to the times, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. hanging people is extreme, so okay, that I can at least make some. Can I can reconcile that in my brain? But a murder scene, I'm just thinking like worst, terrible, most awful thing. Our child is murdered. I don't want a fucking hot dog vendor out there. Like, get your hot dogs, get your hot dogs, check out the dead body. It, it was rare. I want, I want to say it happened with the uh, Valeska. I can't remember how to pronounce that word. Valeska, Valeska. Um, axe murders in that house. Vestalia? Isn't that how you say it? I don't remember. Okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, but, th- but there was those uh, like, like like intense crime scenes like that. Uh, there mm-hmm. was one where, um, oh gosh dang. Oh, what was her name? It was the hoingy boingy lady from uh, Time Suck. Oh, uh, wait. Belle Gunnis? Belle Gunnis. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, my brain is so foggy with uh, the remnants of uh, COVID still. That's okay. But, I'm uh, here for you. Thank you. Uh, but like, you know, there's a bunch of like people supposedly buried on her property, on her farm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I think people like went down there and like explored it and stuff. I don't know. It, it was just a very weird time for a while. I know that that has nothing to do with the paranormal. It was just a specific detail yeah. that stood out to me in the most peculiar way where I thought like, I've never heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Oh, yeah. So the only other thing I'll say, so we're not here for forever, is you said something about at some point someone seeing an orb in, you know, in photos. So while Dan was sick, we were trapped at home together. And he he was harassing our animals. And oh, yeah. And I think I didn't say that here. We didn't say it on this show. But yeah, I had um, this COVID this this past week. I got got it in Salt Lake City. That's right. Because we recorded the bonus episode for uh, Patreon. So only those people know that you were sick. Yeah. Sorry about that. That must have been so confusing. Um, But, anyways, in that video that I took of you harassing Penny and Gigi, people are talking about how they saw saw several orbs. And I have refused to go back and watch the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So somebody else can watch it and then give me a play-by-play. Okay. All right. Are you uh, uh, ready to move uh, away from a place where the paranormal seems to be present to a body where something paranormal seemed to have been present? Yeah, I'm excited for this new kind of twist on a story. And many of the stories we tell here on Scared to Death, while they're, you know, terrifying, they're not entirely without reason. We at least think we can understand them. We can speculate. We're at least able to conceptualize, for example, some dark entity being the result of a brutal event here on Earth like a murderer just talking about that, or we rationalize ghosts as the souls of spirits of those who have died lingering on in the form of some kind of supernatural entity. But sometimes seemingly paranormal events just don't appear as understandable. Sometimes we see signs of something not of this world, and we don't have any idea what they mean, or even if they're good or bad. We don't know if we should be in awe of something larger and more powerful than us or terrified of it. Time now for the mysterious tale of Audrey Santo. Born in Massachusetts on December 19th, 1983, Audrey was the youngest of four children born to Linda and Steve Santo. 
And on August 9th, 1987, three-year-old Audrey was happily playing outside in the driveway with her four-year-old brother, Stephen. When Stephen came inside, upset and alone, Audrey's mother, Linda, and her 12-year-old son, Matthew, ran out to look for Audrey, and they found her face, da- or found her face down in the backyard swimming pool. Matthew quickly dove in, pulled Audrey from the pool, and unconscious, she was rushed to the hospital. At the hospital, the family were told that Audrey was now suffering from something they didn't even know was possible. Young Audrey was both paralyzed and mute. According to her family, she was now afflicted with the most severe form of a brutal condition known as um, akinetic mutism. Her mind was fully alert. She was awake and had normal mental functioning. Oh my gosh. But torturously trapped inside her own body with no way to communicate to the outside world. Holy crap. The family sought second and third opinions. Some coma specialists they consulted told them that Audrey was not conscious inside and had very little brain activity. They hoped those specialists were correct. They hoped that if she was to be trapped inside her own body, at least she wouldn't know she was trapped. Audrey remained in a coma for about three weeks at the hospital in intensive care. Doctors recommended she be placed in an assisted living facility, but the family insisted on bringing her home. And that November, they did. At home, she continued to be in a coma, or was she? Doctors still disagreed on how aware of her surroundings she was. Some thought she was very much alive and aware inside. Others thought she was virtually brain dead. Her EEGs were profoundly abnormal, revealing a very inconsistent and hard to ascertain amount of brain activity. She breathed with the assistance of a ventilator. She ate via a feeding tube, mostly. She would also curiously be able to receive communion wafers via her mouth. Strange, and soon things got stranger. About a year after the accident, Linda took Audrey to Medjugorje, Medjugorje, a popular pilgrimage site in southwestern Bosnia and Herzegovina, where the spirit of the Virgin Mary is said to have appeared periodically to local Catholic children since 1981. There have been so many supposed sightings there that in 1999, the Vatican began approving official pilgrimages to this possibly miraculous site. It was a difficult and expensive journey with an incapacitated four-year-old child, but Linda believed it would be worth it and that the result would be Audrey being healed. She was so hopeful, she even brought along a pair of sandals for Audrey to use once she was Ugh. restored to health. Once there, Linda claimed a miracle. She claimed that Audrey was present when she saw an apparition of the Virgin Mary. According to her mother, Audrey seemed to also detect the presence of this entity, nodding her head as if to say yes when asked if she saw it. Linda then went on to claim that Audrey communicated directly with the Virgin Mary and that she agreed to become a victim soul. A victim soul is someone believed to willingly take on the suffering of others. The Roman Catholic Church recognizes only one victim soul, that of Jesus himself. After this alleged encounter, Audrey went into cardiac arrest and almost died, requiring a medical evacuation back to the U.S. Once back home, things got a lot stranger still. Starting with one painting, spreading to include many paintings and icons within the Santo home, particularly in their garage, oil was said to exude from objects near Audrey enough to spontaneously fill containers placed beneath them. However, no one ever claimed to witness the moment of onset of these discharges, only the already oil-filled containers. Was someone, perhaps Audrey's mother, Linda, doing this to make others think her daughter was miraculous? Perhaps. But statues also reportedly moved on their own when no one was looking, pivoting to face sanctified objects. Sometimes this would happen when no one entered or left the room during the change, so how could Linda have done that? Then there was also the stigmata. Audrey spontaneously bleeding from her palms, from the same spot as Jesus' hands when he was nailed to the cross. This was reportedly witnessed not just by Linda, but by at least one of Audrey's nurses. Also, during several masses at which Audrey was present, what seemed to be human blood appeared on some consecrated communion wafers. A substance that appeared to be blood also appeared in a chalice at the Santo home. And a statue of Mary at the Santo home appeared to sometimes cry blood. Maybe most incredibly, despite all predictions to the contrary, Audrey, still not able to move or communicate with the outside world, continued not just to live, but to grow. Visitors to the house at 64 S. Flag Street in Worcester, Massachusetts, would see a girl with dark, shiny, and fragrant hair gathered at the crown by a red satin bow, cascading onto a pillow and three feet beyond. Her complexion was alabaster, like a statue's. Soon, she was in her early 20s. In this condition, she grew from being a toddler all the way into adulthood which many considered miraculous in and of itself. Her open gray eyes would often be spotted moving back and forth, slowly, as if she was, according to her mother, reading scripture. Many of her visitors, often visiting to pray through Audrey, hoped she could help them with their own pains and worries. They'd claim that visiting Audrey, praying for her intercession, or having others pray or visit her on their behalf, resulted in miraculous healing. 
Audrey once had a rash, similar to a rash usually experienced by those undergoing chemotherapy or cancer, though Audrey never underwent such therapy, had that appear on her body. Those around her believed that was evidence that, as a victim soul, she had taken on suffering of some visitor with cancer. Numerous people have claimed that Audrey somehow saved their life or the life of someone they prayed for. Several area priests even frequently visited, celebrating masses and gathering with groups of their congregations to pray beside her. That went on for over a decade. And it wasn't just the religious who believe in Audrey's supernatural abilities. Bugoslaw Lipinski, a Boston biochemist, would testify to the mysterious nature of the oils found in the home that had supposedly secreted from paintings and other objects near Audrey. He says he ordered a chemical analysis and discovered it to be without the characteristic chemical signature of any known commercial oil. John Harding, former chief of pediatrics at Hanneman Hospital in Worcester, was asked by a priest to examine both this oil and one of Audrey's communion wafers allegedly containing blood, not of this world is how the pediatrician described it all. He brought his microscope, he says, but at the last minute he decided not to use it. Something told him not to, he said, and he felt examining it would invite something bad into his life. He knew that sounded strange, but simply couldn't explain it any other way. Audrey died on April 14th, 2007, at the age of 23, from cardio res cardio respiratory failure. Family, friends, and clergy were at her side, and a petition circulated in the years has been circulated in the years since to make her a saint. So what is to make of her bizarre story? Is it nothing more than a family turning to any explanation they have, fabricating evidence perhaps to explain a random, terrible tragedy? Or even worse, trying to capitalize off of it? Were they able to manipulate a few medical professionals into legitimizing their findings somehow? Or was it much more than that? What if the blood and oil that mysteriously appeared in Audrey's home was somehow proof of God? Or perhaps signs of some other paranormal entity or paranormal power we interpret as God? Huh. Just an interesting story. <laughs> Just a fascinating story. Damn it. <laughs> I should have gotten buzzed. I know. I know. See, wouldn't it be so fun to have buzzers? True. I mean, they wouldn't have to hurt that much. Yeah. It would just be a little like... A little reminder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would want to sit on it so it would get you right in your booty. Like, <laughs> see, see what, oh. Um, okay. I, this is... I'm, I'm going to say this just to say it. I'm going to be hard on this story, and it's not because it's like on the religious end of things. Okay. It just sounds like bullshit. Oh, okay. I just... I'm like, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. First of all, she can't be a saint. No way. Because in, um, if I remember correctly, in order to be, uh, I think it's, in, or, or you're ordained a priest, do they or, ordain you as a saint? You have to perform some sort of miracle. There's criteria. Right. I don't hear any miracles. Well, the healing, that's what they're saying. But there's no like. I know, it could be coincidence. Coincidence. Uh, you know, there was no like laying of hands. They didn't, you know, it wasn't like people came to her and said like, make me better. And then you witnessed it in that person. No. It sounds like they were, like they were praying for other people. And then by happenstance, yeah. I, I just call BS on this whole story. I don't okay. buy it. I, I think, you know, I, I don't know what their financial situation was, but. I don't know if they could afford like extensive testing or it could have just been a weird medical, you know, thing. I mean, we're still learning things. I mm -hmm. mean, look at just as an example, COVID. Like we know that there are yeah. things out there that we don't know yet or things that we don't quite understand. I mean, we still haven't even cured cancer. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. Right. We haven't cured AIDS. There are so many things that we don't know. We right. can't cure MS. We can't cure Parkinson's. Like there are all these diseases that maybe someday we'll be able to be able to cure. So with that thought in mind, I just have to think like it was a horrible tragedy. Yes. She nearly drowned. And that is the guilt as a parent that comes with that. I yeah, can't imagine. would not wish on anybody. Just like horrific. It makes me so upset to even think about it. Yeah. Terrible. I think it was just a freak thing that this like a kinetic whatever. Oh, yeah. It, I, I've never heard of that. And that sounds like its own kind of hellacious torture. Yeah. To potentially have all your mental faculties but not be able to speak taste nothing yeah a you know a kinetic mutism i I'd not heard that either kinetic mutism yeah uh and then and then that thing about like the wafer i mean well i guess you didn't go to church that much but like you know the eucharist just melts in your mouth oh so okay. i don't really have a problem with her oh. her ability to eat that right because you wouldn't have to swallow it no i mean i but just because you take a feeding tube doesn't mean you can't swallow because you'd still have to be able to swallow your own saliva. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it'll just drain down there. Yeah, so it would just be like, I mean, it would, it doesn't get super thick. It, it's like, um, sort of just like a, how the way a piece of paper sort of just dissolves in yeah, water yeah. over time. So I didn't buy that piece of it. 
Uh, I just, I don't okay. know. Yeah. And and then what? So she's the only, if Jesus is real, if Jesus, he, right. she is the only other victim. So get the F out of here. No way. There are so why many. You, why are you pulling back on the fuck? Because we're talking about God. Oh, all right. I don't know. It just feels a little, yeah. Okay. Um, Whatever. Fuck it. Okay. Does it make you happy? <laughs> um, no, I just think like. Okay, you think about like Mother Teresa. I don't even think that she's been ordained a saint. I can't remember. Yeah, I, I'm almost certain that she has not. But you know, I mean, it's not like I've looked yeah. it up any time recently. But let's just say she's not. So Mother Teresa is not a saint, but this chick is. No way. Yeah, I mean, they ha- and they ha- and they haven't made her a saint. Yeah, I know, but like just the the idea that that's something that they want to pursue. I just mm. okay. Mm. And it's not about the religious aspect. Like, I don't want any emails about like, oh, you just don't believe it because you you think bad things can happen and good things can't. It's not that. It has nothing to do with that. Just this particular case it, you don't buy. It's just this scenario that I'm like, meh. meh. All right. Okay. When I was growing up, my childhood best friend, her family was quite religious. Her grandparents came from Italy, like very, very uh, old school religious, you know, all the things, statues everywhere, so many rosaries, like it was actually very sweet. Yeah. And uh she had a Virgin Mary statue in her bedroom and it did cry one time. Weird. It was so weird. And interestingly enough, you know, we talked to her, I mean, she called me, she was like, holy shit. Totally freaked out. Her family was not scared by it at all. And no one went like running to our pastor about it. But I do remember hmm. at one point she talked to one of our teachers and we talked to priest and they were like eh, like just no one even believed huh. her or us they were like yeah you know teenage girls being ridiculous so when you were talking about uh a statue crying in her house i just connected that and thought like man I don't, do people even believe it did they really see it i don't know i mean the oil thing there is the other side of it where there was like the weird collection of oil and then that doctor who was like oh i don't know it just didn't feel of this world and i didn't want to use my microscope uh, yeah, I know, yeah. to bring I mean, whatever, you got to trust your gut. You have to do what you feel is going to keep you and your loved ones safe. But there's just too much, like, it's a different kind of Darren story for me. All right. I don't buy it. You know, I, I like I like I like that uh see that side of you in here. Or usually you usually I'm more of the skeptic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know maybe and I don't, and I'm not saying I do believe it. I just right. uh, I just you know present these and eh, believe mm-hmm. what you want. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know if it's like my catholic upbringing like some sort of mm-hmm. weird connection to it like you're not going to talk about it that way. <laughs> Be- before we move on, I just have a few pictures. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I just wanted to hear you. I had to go off on a tangent. Yeah, that's good. Uh this first one this is little Audrey before the accident. Such a cute oh, kid, so sad. Oh, so cute. And then this is little Audrey not long after the accident. Oh, I just can't so, imagine. Oh, man. Just like a, like a doll. You mm-hmm. know, can't move, can't speak. Eyes open. Uh, Audrey a little bit older here in this next picture. But she did grow so fast, question mark? No, just grew normally. It's just oh, okay. interesting, like, just grew in that state. But I guess, you know, like, it would happen. But just, of course I, that I, would happen. And I just found it interesting where it's like, man, you're not able to communicate you can't move but your body is still maturing and and i just have one more picture of her as a young adult Ugh. what an insane way to i don't even know if i want to say live but to exist to exist when i lived in la i had this family that i nannied for and they have three yeah. children first child completely fine healthy had a second child uh, and a third child i want to say it was their middle child it doesn't matter yeah they had healthy kids and then they had this one child who was born completely healthy. And then one day they were watching whatever and he started seizing uncontrollably. Yeah. And went on to have n- never spoke again. Oh no. Mm-hmm. Never could manage himself in any capacity. How old like, was he when he had the. Uh, like three ish, oh, four ish. And I mean, they predicted that he would live well into his 20s. So what I cannot remember exactly what he had, but all day, every day. He his body is seizing now. Man. Sometimes they're like grand mall, and you can see it, and other times you cannot see it. And so when I, it reminded me of her actually just in that kind of vegetative physical state. But like, yeah, you could kind of communicate like you knew he could hear you, and so it was a very very bizarre scenario. And I want to correct myself. I believe they had one kid, then they had him, then they had the then they had a third child, which is so brave of a choice to make when you have yeah. a child who has any sort of deficit. You're terrified, I'm sure. Yeah, but. You know, that was in the 2000s, and even then they were, like, being involved in experimental treatments and stuff and, you know, going to Harvard and Duke and trying to find it. And so it's like, 
I don't know, it just makes me think, I wonder if it was this akinetic thing or maybe she has mm -hmm. what this kid had. Like, yeah. maybe it is just a very rare, awful thing that just randomly happens. Like maybe she was seizing all the time and they just couldn't quite, because they said she had a lot of brain activity, but like maybe they couldn't figure it out. I don't know. I'm going to be obsessed with akinetic mutism. Uh -huh. Oh boy, I'm going down a rabbit hole later. Okay. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Ugh, put me out of my misery. Yeah, it's so Honestly, sad. Yeah, yeah. so sad. I mean, it's your child, so what a terrible decision to have to make. But I'm telling you right here, we've got it on record. <laughs> I'm diagnosed with that. Take okay. me out, okay? All right. Okay, Um, you have a brand new, I do. fresh Layla from some I, fans in Salt Lake City. It. I'm dealing with a lot of head cold stuff at this moment, so I, it's a little, I can't. I, I would sniff it, but I will. Well, yeah, I don't want to go into it. No. Oh. I have a lot of mucus. Do you need so a, much in my head right now. Do you need a tissue? I need I need a lot of tissues. I think I can just like kind of maintain it for the rest of the show. Are you sure? You have a box of tissues behind you. There's only one left there, and I need about twenty. Oh, okay. We can have Joe bring some in, and we can mute you for a minute. No, I'd have to I'd have to stop the show down and okay. leave for a while and come back. It's it's, it's going to be several minutes of getting stuff out of my head. <gasps> okay. Well, I'll try to be okay. uh, expedient with my storytelling. No, I'm good. Yeah, I'll, I just won't be as talkative as normal. Oh, that's okay. I'm carrying it. I got it. I've got all the talks. I had a big coffee today. But, th but th thank you for the, uh, the the new squishy. Yeah, it did come with a, a poop squishy, a poop emoji squishy, yeah. and a banana squishy, but, but you know. From a nice Salt Lake City creep or peeper. Yes, exactly. Okay, well, uh, our first tale, my first tale this week is a double whammy hat man shadow person combo. Yeah. And I can't really think of any stories where we have dark evil entities teaming up together. N not, yeah, not off the top of my head. Right? I don't know, how awful would that be? Bad mm -hmm. enough to see one, uh, specifically shadow people in the hat man. It would be bad enough to see one, but together too. Mm -hmm. GTFO, right? So let's dive into it and see what is going on here. Hey, Dan and Lindsay. A quick background on me. I used to be a creeper back when I was a child, but as time goes on and I have more experiences, I become more of a peeper. Me too. I hope you enjoy and get a bit spooked. Now, onto my tale, I didn't know they could move. It takes place when I was about 15 or 16 years old. I went to sleep one night at about 9 p.m., only to be suddenly woken up at 3.25 in the morning. I felt a surge of panic run through my body, and I experienced the most intense fear I've ever felt in my life. I looked around the room to see what could be causing me to feel so irrationally fearful. At the foot of my bed was a shadow person. When it comes to being afraid, my fight or flight instinct definitely tends towards fighting, but I couldn't move. All I could do was lie there, terrified and staring at the shadow person. It was about six feet tall and thin. Even though it didn't move or speak at all, I could tell it meant me harm. After a few minutes, the shadow person faded and I was able to move again. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night and was quite tired at school the next day. A couple weeks went by and I had nearly forgotten the experience. I'd heard of sleep paralysis before and assumed that that is what it had been. The next night, though, I was woken up at 3.25 a.m. once again, feeling terrified and unable to move. I looked at the same spot in my room, and there it was again, standing very still, not even breathing. Only it wasn't alone this time. Now there were two. Again, I waited a while, feeling petrified with fear until they disappeared. This pattern continued for months, with more and more of them showing up each time. The most that ever stood at the foot of my bed were six shadow people. Less and less time would lapse between their visits, and they always came between 3.20 and 3.35 a.m., and they always disappeared within a few minutes. I don't know if I was being a Darren, or if it was just because I was a child, or because sleep paralysis seemed, pretty like, uh, seemed like a pretty believable explanation but I still didn't do anything about it and only told a few close friends about my experiences. Then one day, I had an encounter with the shadow people that would change my mind about the possibility of sleep paralysis as a feasible explanation. I was walking from the kitchen to the living room while home alone. I felt that familiar feeling of terror sweep over my body, stopping me in my tracks. There, in the living room, stood two shadow people, and between them was the hat man. The feeling that the hat man gave me was far worse than any that the shadow people ever had. I stood there frozen for what felt like an eternity. Then something that looked like another shadow person, but was instead white and glowing, appeared. It stood still for a few seconds, and then all of them faded away at the same time. I haven't seen a shadow person or the hat man since. 
I've avoided looking into them much because I don't think I want to know what was happening there. I hadn't thought about this in a couple of years, but I was listening to one of your episodes about shadow people, the one from Portugal to be exact. Mm. And the moment they talked about the shadow people moving, I stopped the podcast, took out my earphones and nearly left work early. Wow. Interesting, huh? Uh-huh. To, Interesting. <laughs> to see to see that when uh, they were awake. Yeah, middle of the day. Middle of the day, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, I that think... change things. Absolutely. It gives it so much more credence for me. Because like them, I would totally, you know, justify it away. Ah, it's sleep paralysis. It keeps happening over and over because I keep having sleep paralysis. And the more I think about it, of course, there's more shadow people. Yeah. Like, totally explain it away. Yeah, but then, yeah, but then, yeah, exactly. And, then, and during the day to have to have that experience would change your perspective on the entire event mm-hmm. or series of events. Ye. And then add in the hat man for a two for one combo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so uncomfortable. That would be such an intense encounter. Oh my gosh. What would you do? Would you call me? Would you try to take a photograph? Like, what do you even do? Man, I don't know mm. if you're seeing that by yourself. Yikes. I think if you're alone and you think you see something, I want you to take video or photograph right away. Mm-hmm. Because then if at least we can examine mind, it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Try to at least. Try your best. What, what if you did that and, th- and then you look back at the footage and there's just nothing there? How frustrating would that be? Would you assume that you're just crazy? Your imagination is just uh, ran yeah. wild? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it would take a while to really accept that as an answer, but that would be my initial instinct is to justify like, oh my gosh, Lindsay, you must have been so tired. It was the like. What if you saw them so clearly? Oh God. And then took video. I'm picturing like a horror movie scene where you're like looking at your phone Mm -hmm. and as you're taking the video, they're not showing up. Mm. Mm, That would be so interesting. Like Mm -hmm. you don't even see them in the phone. Right. Gosh, I hadn't thought about that. Oh gosh, dang. (laughs) (laughs) Huh. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I would be doing the like phone, like, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then if I'm seeing both, then, then I'm really losing my mind. But what if you, you know, grab your phone, whip it up to take a photograph or a video and they're, gone in the phone and then also gone in life that's confusing too Mm -hmm. i don't know let's just hope we don't see anything okay okay um all right are you ready for another story about a dream that becomes life oh yeah Mm -hmm. some kind of ominous prediction yeah very uncomfortable kind of dream you know it's like we always say like how it's just a dream that's how we justify so many things that we think we see Mm -hmm. but what if you had a dream and then you woke up and it was replicated right there in front of you Wouldn't that be terrible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, let's find out how terrible it really was. Getting right into it, the author says, my mom, stepdad, brother, sister, and I moved into an apartment about 15 minutes away from my grandparents' house. I was 10, my brother was seven, my sister was two. On the weekends, my brother and I went to my dad's house. Only my mom, stepdad, and sister were home when the story took place. The apartment had only one bedroom where my brother and I had a bunk bed while my mom, stepdad, and my sister slept on a mattress to the side of the bunk bed. On this particular night, my stepdad was having a very bad but very vivid dream. In his dream, he saw a hunched old witch grab my sister by her feet and pull her off the mattress mattress, and drag her out into the hallway. He felt helpless as if he could not move or do anything to stop the witch. He kept trying to move and to talk but his body would not budge. Finally, when he was able to move, he frantically woke up my mom to tell her about his most terrifying dream. The room was so dark and they couldn't really see my sister. He didn't realize it was more than just a dream until they went to check on my sister. They turned on the light and there was my sister lying on the floor in the doorway. The door was open and it looked as if she had been dragged out of the room by her legs. Oh my God. Straight off the mattress and into the hallway just as he had dreamt. The way she was positioned was with her legs out in the hallway, but her face and torso and arms still in the bedroom. This scared him so much because it was clearly more than just a dream. From that night forward, he made sure that every time they went to sleep, my sister was smushed in the middle. My mom spoke to a neighbor... (laughs) Shortly thereafter, and the neighbor mentioned that she had seen weird things by the apartment and that a murder had, in fact, taken place there before. We ended up moving back to my grandparents' house as soon as our lease ended. Ugh. That, that, that's a cool twist, a little detail we haven't, yeah, haven't heard before. Uh-huh. Where if you had a dream that, yeah, something happened to somebody in your family and then wake up and then their body positioning and just like, you know, like a, 
like the aftermath matches what you had had in your dream. Because mm -hmm. it's innocent <sighs> enough, right? Like nothing, yeah. nothing bad per se happened. No one got hurt. Yeah, but how sound uncomfortable. Like she woke up. Sounds like she was still asleep, right? When she was laying in the doorway. It sounds like it. Yeah. Uh, that would freak me out too. Uh -huh. and, and then especially hearing like a neighbor say they've seen weird things after that, and that there was a murder there. I yeah. Mean, I wonder what the details of the murder were. Uh, like well, that's somebody kinda, dragged out of the bed. That's what I was thinking. Or someone like trying to like get away, like go down oh, a hallway man. and go into a room to close a door to try and preserve themselves. Uh, right? Mm -hmm. I, it made me think about all the times our kids have been sick and they either come and join us in bed or we join them in bed, right? You're like giving them Tylenol every four hours. Somebody's got stomach flu, like whatever it is. And, you know, so you're kind of like exhausted anyways. And the more tired I am, but then having to get up puts me in a less deep sleep. Yeah. And I tend to have more vivid dreams then. I mean, if I woke yeah. up thinking like, oh, I have to give Monroe Tylenol, but also was having some weird, creepy dream. And then she was somehow duplicating that. No way. No, thank you. Holy crap. <laughs> Holy crap. And kids are so creepy when they sleep. They say so many weird things when they sleep. I know. That it's funny that the kids went that long phase. Remember, it was like once a night, Kyler would speak in his sleep. <laughs> for like, for, I don't know, a couple years. years. Yeah. Yep. And it, it was just one time. He, <laughs> it was usually about a half an hour or so after he fell asleep. Uh-huh. You just hear some statement up there. I don't, I'm fine. I'll be fine tomorrow. <laughs> and, and then just, that was it. But it was so regular. It was so Monroe, weird. Monroe, Monroe had it for a while too. too yeah. yeah. I haven't. I can't. I'll forget about it. <laughs> just nonsense. Yeah. I haven't heard either one of them in a long time. Mm -mm. Yeah, they went Funny. through that phase. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's part of growing up. I have no idea. I don't know why we sleep talk actually. So, fine. All right. Well, do you have time for one more? Of course I do. Oh, well, that's so great. Well, settle in. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about a ghost that likes to smoke. Oh, yeah. yeah that's right. You mentioned the smoking ghost earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This this is very bizarre. And it made me think about our studio and how I would feel if I came into the studio and smelled a particular scent every time I came in that didn't belong here. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Cigarette smoke is such a specific yep. smell. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, here we go. Hey, Creep fam, I'd love to go off about what a huge fan I am of you two, Aww. your work, and the community you've created with this wonderfully spoopy show, but I tend to ramble, so let's just get on with it. I own a photography studio right cool. in the heart of our downtown area. The building is amazing and has been restored a few times since it was originally built in 1855. The downtown area is filled with buildings from that era, and the history in this town goes even deeper. A lot of locals here have a get-out-of-my-hometown attitude, but I love it here. In fact, you may be semi-familiar with it as Dan did a time suck on Arthur Shawcross that oh. included our historic town of Watertown, New York. Mm -hmm. I'm actually right around the corner from the old prison he was first in that's now an antique shop, and it's creepy, <laughs> a uh, <laughs> creepy <laughs> AF. <laughs> Anyways. The town most recently renovated the building I'm in, starting back in 2019, and they finished up in my floor in 2020. I've been in this particular suite since March of 2020, and let me tell you, it's been on and off eerie from the start. I came into the building and shared a suite on the floor below with another photographer friend of mine while they finished up our floor and individual studios, and nothing, uh, nothing strange ever happened. Uh, no, nothing ever felt off or weird being in the building, even alone at night. In fact, I loved being there alone. However, that changed about a month after moving up to the third floor into my own suite. My office is shaped like an L, if you will. Imagine you walk in, it's about a four foot wide entryway that goes for about seven feet and then opens up to the rest of the studio. The space is so small, that's what makes this story so weird. I came into work one morning to get some editing done before a session, and right as I walked in, I was hit with the overwhelming smell of cigarettes. It wasn't in the hallway, it wasn't lingering in the staircase or the elevator, hell, it wasn't even past the closet door, just in my entryway. Immediately, I thought it must be one of the construction guys working on the building coming in from a smoke break and stinking the place up. It was just, it was just getting stuck right by my door, awesome. A few days later, same thing. Coming up, no smell of anything, not in the halls, not the stairs. But as soon as I walked into my suite, it was like a wall of cigarette smoke. But as soon as you got to my desk where the room opens up wide, nothing. 
I called a friend from down the hall to come and see if she could smell it as well. You know, make sure I'm not making this shit up or going crazy. But she could smell it too. The look on her face as soon as she came past the threshold said it all. I asked her to come in further to see if she smelled anything, and just like I thought, nothing. It was only in that very small entry space. It made zero sense to me. I grew up with smokers, and that shit wafts all over the place when it's around. Surely I would have smelled it in the whole suite, or at least in the hallway, right? So this goes on every single time I come into work for about the next month. I often listen to your podcast while editing, and while it never bothered me before, now I was starting to get the chills. I would see the reflection of the coat rack just over my shoulder on the monitor and would have to turn around to make sure it was just, in fact, the coat rack. Ridiculous. I've had a few experiences in the past where I've heard things, seen things, even felt things that make me question what's out there. I'm a believer, but good lord, I don't want it. (laughs) Eventually, I got used to the smoke and even named this smelly presence George. I don't know why, but that's just what came to me. One morning, I was working while listening, and Lindsay said something about, you have to tell it to leave. Make it clear that this is your space, and so on. And I thought, to hell with it, what could it hurt? This presence presence isn't moving my things, it's not bothering me in any way or keeping me from working, it's just stinking up the doorway. (laughs) So feeling like an absolute nut job, I walked into that space that still stunk and said out loud, George, you cannot be doing this. I'm not a smoker. I cannot stand the smell. And other people know you're here too. You've got to take that shit elsewhere. You are welcome here. We can share the space, but the cigarettes have to stop. And I shit you not, I haven't smelled smoke since. It's wild. Just (laughs) wild. I feel so silly even writing this out. It's not the scariest thing in the world. I know, but I'm happy to share it with you either way. You guys and the crew are absolutely amazing. Keep doing what you're doing. You make this world a better place. Much love from New York. Oh, well, thank you. And uh, what a polite ghost I know. <laughs> to, you know, respectfully accept your wishes. Be like, okay, I'll, I can hang out here, but I don't have smoke. I love the tiny bit of confirmation <laughs> it creates. Yeah. Of just like, no, okay, first of all, correct. Ask it to knock it off. Mm-hmm. And it did? Come on. I know. That is, it. That that is uh, I, I, I wish there was something. Fascinating. Somebody, I know. I know. I, something unique. besides. Yeah, unique. Or I don't even know. Interesting is the best word. It's okay. Just go for it. You can use wild, cool, and interesting as much as you want today because <laughs> your brain is so fogalicious. It's, it's, it's coming back. But um, just to have that sequence of events where you smell it first, always in the same spot, then you get somebody to confirm it. They're smelling it too. Mm-hmm. And then to uh, ask it to stop smoking and then no longer smell the cigarette smoke after that. I mean, that's that's... If, if that happens to me, I definitely believe it's paranormal. Right. And I definitely believe just a little bit it? more because mm-hmm. I, but I, I could, I could 100% find a way to justify it away. Right. I could say like, well, you know, I, I never confirmed where it was coming from. Maybe there was something in the ducks. Like I, I would try. I know I would try mm, because yeah. I, like this uh, fan, I also don't want to believe it. I, like, I don't want it. Right. You know, it's like, it's too much. It's overwhelming. It's scary. It's uncomfortable. Blah, blah, blah. So momentarily, I would feel like, yep, okay, this is real. But then over time, I, it would make me uncomfortable to come in, even though it didn't make me feel scared. Yeah. I still don't like it. Yeah. You know, so it's like, maybe, maybe it was this. Like, I would try to find out if there was like a new tenant that had moved uh, in and yeah. moved out. I don't know. Ah, man. Timing would have to be perfect for it to be anything other than the paranormal mm-hmm. of somebody who happened to just like live above that space who was smoking. I know. And then, you know, stopped smoking the second you happened to give this command or give this request. I know. Ah. I know. It does feel like an incredibly valid story. Mm-hmm. Just for my own personal sanity, I'm sure that at some point I would try and make it not true. Yeah. Yeah. You uh, get it? Yep. It's wild. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do some Annabelle shout outs? I do. Do you want me to start or do you want to start? Why don't you go and then yeah. that'll give you a little break before you have to do our closing. Okay. Okay. Off you go. I would like to thank the uh, following Annabelles for supporting us on Patreon. Thank you so much to Kobe Johnston, Danzia D, uh, De Ocampo, Danzia, Danzia De Ocampo, Michael Brennan, Jer- yeah, Jared uh, or Gerard uh, Britton, Trevor Ooh, boy, I got some tough ones today. Schwartfager. I didn't even do that Schwartfager. on purpose. Uh, Schwarzenegger? <laughs> kind of, KSI, Earl Riggs, Kenneth Von Rowan II, Brandy Jensen, Oksana Savenko, Heshley Thompson, 
Jessica Campbell, Tori Peters, Sarah Cutler, Liana Jones, Gabby, Marcy Coons, Whitney Birchfield, Carolyn Kingdon, Jordan Allen, Delaney, or Del sorry, Delana Malazzi, Haley Harper, Laura Turner, Audrey Stuckey, Jose Garcia Jr. Very well. I'd like to thank the following Annabelles one more time for helping us to donate to the Halo Dental Network. Sequoia Harold, Camille Klum, Brandon and Nicole Tanya, Justin Elliott, Matt Stubbs, Christy Cornelson, Bailey, Heather, El Heather Elledge, Dustin Harris, Angel Ocho, Jeremy Horde, Jenny Gibson, Zigsel, Savannah Watson, Eli Holmes, Catherine Clements, Veronica Molina, Pants Shittington. Ha! <laughs> Very nice. Yep. Real name. Sarah Lee, Joshua Martini, Brandon Keenholz, Jeffrey Lawrence, Amber, C-U, just the initials. Okay. Destiny, Emily Woods, and Jason Neal. Well done. Thank you. Emily, I'm sorry I chopped your name out of previous episodes. This poor gal, she emails and she's like, hey, like it's really been a long time. And I'm like, Aww. and I ha <laughs> it was went into the episode, but when I did a cut and paste, I just cut and paste yours and then I cut and paste mine and hers just got chopped, chopped. Oh, well, sorry, Em. Got to figure it out now. My bad. Better late than never. Can I do some spoobies? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, some spooky shout outs to David from K. Happy wedding. Happy birthday. I love you. To Nancy from Deja. Love and miss you, my work wife. Stay cool in your Texas pool. <laughs> to Cal from Alicia and Lucas. Happy birthday. To Kelly from Austin. Happy anniversary. And to Austin from your mom, Stephanie. Happy birthday. How many birthdays? Happy birthdays. Birthday, birthday, birthday. Uh, and that's our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else at info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith and Liz Hernandez for the work on social media and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to Joe Paisley for producing and directing today. Uh, pretty much uh, most days. Almost every day. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. And to our book editor, Drew Atana, for polishing and preparing the listener stories for the upcoming book number three. Oh, man, we just sent it to the printer. Exciting. We'll let you guys know when they're on sale soon. Thanks to producers Olivia Lee for finding my first story today and to Sophie Evans for finding the second. You can subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch a show in addition to listening to it. And you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Scared to Death Podcast if you want more content like the pictures for, from each show. And we have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, if you want more horror interaction in your life. Thank you to Liz Hernandez for moderating that. And if you don't want to hear ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon and get the entire catalog ad-free. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare to death. Bad Magic Productions. 